the Zeitgeist Movement defined SA 13 Post Scarcity Trends, Capacity, and Efficiency, Part 2. Post Scarcity Worldview. In this section, basic statistics and trends will be presented to show how we can, as a global society, achieve a post scarcity social system. While scarcity in absolute terms will always be with humanity to one degree or another in this closed system of earthly resources, scarcity on the level of human needs and basic material success is no longer a viable defense of the market system's allocation methods. As a brief aside, a common defense of the price system and the market is that if any scarcity exists, it makes void any other approach. The argument goes that since not everyone can have XYZ, XYZ is scarce and hence people need money or have a lack thereof to filter out who gains XYZ and who doesn't. The problem with this assumption is that it ignores how certain resources and hence goods have more relevance than others when it comes to public health. Comparing the scarcity of a very expensive luxury car which draws status satisfaction from its owner more than its basic purpose as a mode of transport with the scarcity of food which is a core life requirement for health is not legitimate in real life terms. The former interest, while perhaps important to the ego satisfaction of the owner, who likely already has his or her basic needs met to afford such a product, is not equivalent to the latter interest of those who have little or nothing to eat and hence cannot survive. One cannot arbitrarily conflate such needs and wants as though they are simply the same in theory. Sadly, this is how the market system behaves. Likewise, with great wealth and material imbalance comes inevitable social destabilization. Virtually every large-scale public dissent and revolution we have seen in the past couple hundred years have had some economic basis, usually revolving around societal imbalance, exploitation, and class separation. The same goes for the roots of crime, terrorism, addictions, and other social problems. Virtually all of these propensities are born out of deprivation, whether absolute or relative, and this deprivation is inherent to the nature of a society based on competition and scarcity. So to simply reduce our economic reality down to mere trade, coupled with the claim that any degree of scarcity justifies the use of the market, price and money for allocation is to ignore the true nature of what ensures social harmony, stability and public health. Would it seem reasonable to forego the technical ability to, say, elevate 80% of humanity to the material capacity currently held by only 10% today, simply because not everyone can own a 500-room mansion? Again, the absurdity of this objection is quite clear when a system perspective is taken with respect to what underscores true public health and social stability. That aside, below is a list of current life support realities available to the global population that have gone unharnessed due to inhibiting factors inherent to the market economy. Each point will be addressed in its own subsection. Number 1. Food Production Current production methods already produce more than enough food to feed all human beings on Earth. Furthermore, current trends toward more optimized technology and agricultural methods also show a capacity to further increase production, efficiency, and nutrition quality to a state of active abundance, with minimal human labor and increasingly less energy, water, and land requirements. Number 2. Clean Water Desalination and decontamination processes currently exist to such a vast degree of application that no human being, even in the present state of pollution levels, would ever need to be without clean water, regardless of where they are on Earth. Number 3. Energy between geothermal, wind, solar, and hydro, coupled with system-based processes that can recapture expelled energy and reuse it directly, there is an absolute energy abundance which can provide for many times the current world's population. Number 4. Material Production Access the spectrum of material production from buildings to transport to common goods has experienced a powerful merging of capital goods, consumer goods, and human labor. 
With proper system incorporation of each genre of production, coupled with optimized regeneration processes and a total transformation from the use of property rights to a system of access rights, it is clear that all known good functions in the form of product can be utilized by 100% of humanity on a per-need basis in access abundance. Carrying Capacity However, before these four issues are addressed in detail, an analysis of the Earth's carrying capacity is in order. Carrying capacity is defined as the maximum equilibrium number of organisms of a particular species that can be supported indefinitely in a given environment. Speculation on the Earth's carrying capacity with respect to human beings, meaning how many people the Earth and its biosphere can support has been a controversial subject for many centuries. For example, a 2001 United Nations report said that two-thirds of the estimates they noted at that time fell in the range of 4 billion to 16 billion with a median of about 10 billion. However, technological change and its capacity to increase efficiency with respect to how our resources are used presents an ongoing interference in such attempts to arrive at a tangible empirical figure. The reality is that the number of people the Earth can support is highly variable and based in part on the current state of technology at a given time and the more we progress our scientific and technical understanding the more people we tend to be able to support with less energy and resources applied per person. Of course this isn't to imply that within the closed system of the earth we have some infinite capacity to reproduce. Rather it highlights the relevance of what it means to be strategic, intelligent, and efficient with our resource use and by extension the industrial economic process itself. Today there is no evidence that we are at or are closely approaching the earth's carrying capacity. If we take into account the trends that reveal our vast potential to do more with less, coupled with a value system that clearly recognizes that we, as a species, occupy a closed Earth system with natural limitations overall, and that it is our personal responsibility to ourselves, each other, and future generations to keep an interest in balance, efficiency, and sustainability. This educational imperative suggests that a conscious, informed global culture can stabilize its reproduction rate, if need be, without external force, if this basic relationship is properly understood. Of course, much could be said about the influence of old traditional beliefs, such as religious doctrines that appear to suggest that ongoing and constant procreation is a virtue. These views, which originated in the absence of the knowledge we have today regarding our shared existence on a finite planet, will likely be overcome naturally with education. Likewise, if current regions of accelerating population growth are analyzed, it is found that those existing in deprivation and poverty are reproducing faster than those who are not in poverty. While there is some controversy as to why this pattern prevails, the correlation appears to still be accurate. This evidence suggests that increasing people's standards of living can curtail their rates of reproduction, and this furthers the social imperative to create a more equitable system of resource allocation. Food Production According to the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization, one out of every eight people on Earth nearly one billion people, suffer from chronic undernourishment. Almost all of these people live in developing countries, representing 15% of the population of these countries. Poverty is, needless to say, clearly linked to this phenomenon. Yet politics and business aside, world agriculture today actually produces 17% more calories per person than it did 30 years ago, despite a 70% population increase. There is enough food to provide everyone in the world with at least 2,720 kilocalories per day, which is more than enough to maintain good health for most. Therefore, the existence of such a large number of chronically hungry people in the developing world today reveals, at a minimum, that there is something fundamentally wrong with the global industrial and economic process itself and not the Earth's carrying capacity or humanity's ability to process enough resources. 
According to the Institution of Mechanical Engineers, we produced globally about 4 billion metric tons of food per annum. Yet due to poor practices in harvesting, storage, and transportation, as well as market and consumer wastage, it is estimated that 30 to 50 percent of all food produced never reaches a human stomach. Furthermore, this figure does not reflect the fact that large amounts of land, energy, fertilizers, and water have also been lost in the production of foodstuffs, which simply end up as waste. In the words of food waste researcher Valentin Thurn, the number of calories that end up in the garbage in North America and Europe would be sufficient to feed the hungry of this world three times over. Economically, first world waste patterns can create price increases for the global food supply due to increased demand resulting from those very waste patterns. In other words, the first world adds to the world hunger epidemic by its waste patterns on the consumer end because the resulting demand from increased waste increases price values past what is affordable for many. While there is certainly an educational imperative for the consuming world to consider the relevance of their waste patterns in the current climate, both in terms of real food waste and its effect on global prices due to increased demand because of this waste, it appears that the most effective and practical means to overcome this global deficiency is to update the system of food production itself with modern methods. This coupled with deliberate localization of the process itself in order to reduce the vast spectrum of waste caused by inefficiencies in the current global food supply chain would not only reduce such problems in general, it would dramatically increase productivity, product quality, and output overall. While the active use of arable land and land-based agriculture should remain ideally, of course, with more sustainable practices than we are using today, a great deal of pressure can be alleviated at this time with advanced soilless methods which require less water, less fertilizer, fewer or no pesticides, less land, and less labor. These facilities can now be built in urban city environments or even off coastlines at sea. Perhaps the most promising of all such arrangements is what is known today as vertical farming. Vertical farming has been put to test in a number of regions with extremely promising results regarding efficiency, extrapolating these statistics coupled with parallel trend advancement, increases in efficiency of the associated mechanisms of this process, reveals that the future of abundant food production will not only, compared to the current land-based tradition, use fewer resources per unit output, cause less waste, have a reduced ecological footprint, increase food quality, and the like, it will also use less of the surface of the planet and enable types of food that were once restricted to certain climates or regions to be grown virtually anywhere in enclosed vertical systems. While approaches vary, common methods include rotating crop systems in transparent enclosures to use natural light, coupled with hydroponic, aeroponic, and or aquaponic water and nutrient servicing systems. Artificial light systems are also being used along with other means to distribute natural light such as the use of parabolic mirror systems that can move light without electricity. Many waste to energy systems approaches to these structures are increasingly common as with advanced power systems based on regenerative processes or localized sources. Between various approaches, the capacity is dramatically increased since food can be grown almost 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Common objections to this type of farming have mostly been concerns over its energy footprint, criticizing the use of artificial light in some arrangements as too power intensive. However, the use of renewable energy systems such as photovoltaics coupled with regional placement most conducive to renewable methods such as near wave, tidal, or geothermal sources presents plausible solutions for sustainable non-hydrocarbon based powering. However, it is best to think about this in a comparative context. In the U.S., up to 20% of the country's fossil fuel consumption goes into the food chain, according to the UN's Food and Agricultural Organization, FAO, which points out that fossil fuel use by the food systems in the developed world often rivals that of automobiles. 
In Singapore, a vertical farm system custom built in a transparent enclosure uses a closed loop automated hydraulic system to rotate the crop in circles between sunlight and an organic nutrient treatment, costing only about $3 a month in electricity for each enclosure. This system is also reported as 10 times more productive per square foot than conventional farming, with much less water, labor, and fertilizer used as noted above. There is also no real transport cost, given all produce is distributed locally, saving more resources and energy. Overall, there is a spectrum of applications as of now and in many cases. These pre-existing structures not intended for such work are being utilized. In Chicago, Illinois, USA, the world's largest certified organic vertical farm is in operation. While producing mostly greens for the local Chicago market, this 90,000 square foot facility uses an aquaponics system with waste from tilapia fish providing nutrients for the plants. The farm reportedly saves 90% of its water compared to conventional farming techniques and produces no agricultural runoff. Additionally, all of its waste, such as plant roots, stems, and even biodegradable packaging, is recycled in collaboration, making it a zero-waste facility. Current statistics vary with respect to the efficiency, often due to monetary-based limitations and inherent profitability concerns. As with much in the market system, promising technology finds development only if it proves competitive. Given how new these ideas are, we cannot expect to see many examples, nor can we expect to see an optimization of such methods to a high degree for measurement without market acceptance. However, we can extrapolate the realized potential of existing systems, scaling the application out as if it were incorporated in every major city in its most relatively efficient form. The following list confirms the superiority of this approach to the current traditional land-based model, not only showing a more sustainable practice, but a more productive practice, which can, in concert with existing methods, provide the entire world's population with vegetable-based nutrition many times over. Versatile. Unlike traditional farming, vertical farms can be constructed anywhere, even on water, using upward layers to multiply output capacity i.e. a 10-story farm will produce one-tenth of a 100-story farm. This space utilization is limited mostly to architectural possibility. Likewise, the plants grown can be on demand in many ways since region-based restrictions have been lifted since these farms can grow virtually anything. Reduced resource use. Vertical farming uses substantially less water and pesticide and is more conducive to non-hydrocarbon-based nutrient fertilizer methods. Its energy use can vary based on application, but in its most efficient setting, it uses dramatically less energy both to power the farm itself and with respect to the now removed need for excess hydrocarbon fertilizer and oil-fueled transport, which is a heavy burden in the current farm-based process. More sustainable, less ecological damage. The current tradition of farming has been recognized as one of the most ecologically destructive processes of modern society. In the words of environmental writer Renee Cho, quote, as of 2008, 37.7% of global land and 45% of U.S. land was used for agriculture. The encroachment of humans into wild land has resulted in the spread of infectious diseases, the loss of biodiversity, and the disruption of ecosystems. Overcultivation and poor soil management has led to the degradation of global agricultural lands. The millions of tons of toxic pesticides used each year contaminate surface waters and groundwater and endanger wildlife. Agriculture is responsible for 15% of global greenhouse gas emissions and accounts for one-fifth of U.S. fossil fuel use, mainly to run farm equipment, transport food, and produce fertilizer. As excess fertilizer washes into rivers, streams, and oceans, it can cause eutrophication. 
algae blooms proliferate. When they die, they are consumed by microbes, which use up all the oxygen in the water. The result is a dead zone that kills all aquatic life. As of 2008, there were 405 dead zones around the world. More than two-thirds of the world's fresh water is used for agriculture. End quote. Post-scarcity capacity. Students at Columbia University working on vertical farm systems determined that in order to feed 50,000 people, a 30-story building the size of a New York City block would be needed. A New York City block, loosely speaking, is about 6.4 acres. If we extrapolate this into the context of the city of Los Angeles, California, USA, with a population of about 3.9 million, with a total acreage of about 318,912, it would take roughly 78 30-story, 6.4 covering land acre structures to feed the local residents. This amounts to about 0.1% of the total land area of Los Angeles to feed the population. The earth, being about 29% land, has roughly 36,794,240,000 acres and a human population of 7.2 billion as of late 2013. If we extrapolate the same basis of a 30-story vertical farm covering 6.4 acres to feed 50,000 people, we end up needing 144,000 vertical farms, in theory, to feed the world. This amounts to 921,600 acres of land to place these farms. Given roughly 38% of all the Earth's land is currently being used for traditional agriculture, 13,981,811,200 acres, we find that we need only 0.006% of the Earth's existing farmland to meet production requirements. Now these extrapolations are clearly theoretical, and obviously many other factors need to be taken into account with respect to placement of such farm systems and critical specifics. Also, within the 38% land use statistic, much of that land is for livestock cultivation, not just crop production. However, the raw statistics are quite incredible with respect to possible efficiency and capacity. In fact, if we were to theoretically take only crop production land alone currently being used, which is about 4,408,320,000 acres, replacing the land-based cultivation process by placing these 30-story vertical farm systems only side-by-side, side, the food output would be enough to feed 34.5%. 4 trillion. Given that we will only need to feed 9 billion by 2050, we only need to harness about 0.02% of this theoretical capacity, which it could be argued likely makes rather moot any seemingly practical objections common to the aforementioned extrapolation. As a final note, Proteins which are readily available in the vegetative realm are still brought into question in the modern day with respect to interest in meat production. From a sustainability standpoint, ignoring the common moral issues and arguably inhumane practices still common to industrialized livestock cultivation, the production of meat is an environmentally unfriendly act today. According to the ILRI, livestock systems occupy about 45% of the Earth's surface. According to the FAO, livestock sector produces more greenhouse gas emissions than modern gas-consuming transport. Given that 90% of all the large fish once thrived thriving in the ocean are gone due to overfishing as well, new solutions are needed. One such solution is aquaculture, which is the direct farming of fish, crustaceans, and the like. The direct approach, if sustainably driven, can provide farm-raised, protein-rich fish for human consumption, replacing the demand for land-based meat. Another approach is the production of in vitro meat. In vitro meat may be produced as strips of muscle fiber, which grow through the fusion of precursor cells, either embryonic stem cells or specialized satellite cells found in muscle tissue. This type of meat is usually cultured in a bioreactor. While still experimental in 2013, the world's first lab-grown burger was cooked and eaten in London. 
Other benefits include the reduction of livestock sourced diseases, which is very common, along with being able to avoid certain negative health characteristics of traditional meat, such as the removal of fatty acids in production.